Hello, my name is Christy Hodson, and I'm pastor at the Stoneham Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church, located at 29 Maple Street. For over 100 years, our church has been serving the communities in and around Stoneham, Massachusetts. We currently have a clothing distribution and food bank for Stoneham residents that's located at 9 Gary Street. We also operate Greater Boston Academy, an elementary and preschool located at 108 Pond Street. We thank you for joining us here today at our weekly church service. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Uh, this morning, Carol and I will be leading the song service and we thought nothing more appropriate than hymn number 136. Good Christians now rejoice. In this period of Christmas, we can share the rejoicing together. We'll do all three verses, yes. time of year as we get to sing. We've heard in Sabbath school how the angels um, accompany God in his singing. Now we get to share that praise as well. Let's flip a few hymns to the right to hymn 142. We'll do three verses of this, the first, the second and the fourth. Hymn 142, Angels We Have Heard on High. <laughs>
Now come join us with our first hymn for the service. This first hymn is going to be a little special. Um, there is a spontaneous choir that's about to form. So as you're opening to the first hymn, let us all sing with praise. Hymn number 126. Thank you. You may be seated. Everybody's in the Christmas spirit today. That's awesome. And watching these beautiful young people walk down the aisle, it's like a little mini Christmas fashion show. They're so cute. All right, so how many of you guys know what's going to happen on Wednesday? What's Wednesday? Christmas. Christmas. What does Christmas mean to you? You get presents. You get presents. <laughs> Do you have a special present you're hoping to get? Yeah, but you can't say, right? All right, well, this morning our story is a little bit about Christmas. So I'm going to tell you the legend of the candy cane. Have any of you guys heard this story before? Yeah. Oh, you have? You want to help me tell it? <laughs> you can help me. According to the legend of the candy cane, the candy cane was first created back in the 18th century. At that time, a certain area of Europe, there was said to be a ban on public display of Christianity. Christians were oppressed, and no Bibles or crosses could be owned at that time. So one man found this oppression distressing, and he wished he could share the love of Jesus and the joy of Christmas with the rest of the world. When Christmas came around, children didn't get to see the nativity scene or enjoy learning about the truth of Christmas. So as a candy maker, 
This man prayed to find a way that he could offer local children a Christmas gift that would allow him to communicate the real story of Christmas. So if you look at a candy cane, it looks like a shepherd's staff. He chose to make the candy cane in the shape of a shepherd's staff. After all, Jesus is a shepherd to his followers, and the Bible says the sheep would hear his voice and follow him. Anthony, would you please read Psalms 23, 1? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The candy cane also makes the letter J. And the shape um, of the J, which stands for Jesus. Anthony, would you read Luke 1, verse 31, please? And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. A candy cane is also hard. The candy maker, ma candy maker made the candy hard to demonstrate that it was like a rock, and Jesus is our rock, dependable and strong. Anthony, would you please read Psalm 31.3, please? For you are my rock and my fortress, therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. So what colors are the candy cane? Red and white. So do you know what the red stripes stand for? What? Jesus' blood. Jesus' blood. Well, we've got a sharp group down here. Yeah, it stands for the blood that Jesus spilled on the cross in order to give us um, eternal life. Um, Anthony, would you please read Revelation, or John 3.16, please? Yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Beautiful. Isn't that a great gift to have everlasting life where we'll never be sick or there'll never be any more disappointments? So what do you think the white stands for on the candy cane? It stands for purity, that Jesus washed our sins away. Next year, this young man's going to tell this story for me. It represents God's holiness and purity because Jesus was sinless. Anthony, could you please read 1 John 1, 7? But if we walk in the light as he in, is in the light, we have the fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So there's one other thing about the candy cane that I hadn't really thought about. The peppermint was a flavor that the candy maker chose for the candy cane. Peppermint was very similar to hyssop, which was used for sacrifice and purification in the Old Testament, reminding us of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. It also reminds us of the spices brought by the wise men when they came to visit Jesus. Anthony, could you read Psalms 51.7, please? Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And of course, when the candy cane is eaten, it's also broken. Okay? Which is a reminder that when Jesus was crucified on the cross, his body was broken for us. Could you please read 1 Corinthians 11:24? And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the candy cane is also made to be given as a gift, representing the love of Jesus when he gives us the gift of salvation. Well, it's easier said when you have two hands to use, but if you put two candy canes together, it makes a heart. So although no one's quite sure if this legend is actually true, the beauty of the legend is that it's a really beautiful reminder of God's love and Christmas that surrounds us. In this legend, it was a way that the candy maker could tell the children the story of Christmas, and still today, we have candy canes as a reminder of the real reason we celebrate Christmas. 
Now, I have a little something for each one of you kids, but you can't, you can't open it until you talk to your parents about it, okay? Would you like to take a candy cane? Actually, that one's broken. Take a couple of them. They're little, and I really don't need these at home. Here, let me help you. You want a big one? I have, I have these special ones for you guys here. Here you go. You're welcome. Here. So you guys want to do me a favor? You want to stand up here and face the audience with me? Can you stand up? And turn around and show everybody how great you look this morning. Okay, now just face this, <laughs> face the front. Okay, on the count of three, can you guys say with me Merry Christmas? Okay, ready? Turn around that way and look at the audience. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Merry Christmas. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Uh, today, I would like to share a short story about the Christmas tree. Pastor James Hoffer reports, several years ago, when I was pastoring a church in Michigan, I rebaptized a godly lady who in earlier years had been a faithful member but had fallen away. All went well until Christmas rolled around. She learned that the decorating committee was going to place a Christmas tree in the sanctuary. She's strongly objective, and she said she would not be returning until church, on, to church until January. Sure enough, when January was back, on, she was back on a regular basis until the following December. But we respected her opinion. We certainly don't have to think alike on every issue. Does Ellen White say anything about this? Yes, she does. God will be well pleased if on Christmas, each church would have a Christmas tree on which shall hung offerings, great and small, for these houses of worship. Letters of inquiry have come to us asking, shall we have a Christmas tree? We will, Will it not be like the world? We answered. You can make it like the world if you have a disposition to do so, or you can make it as unlike the world as possible. There is no particular sin in selecting a fragrant evergreen and, praise, and placing it in our churches, but the sin lies in the motive which prompts to action and the use which is made to of the gift placed upon the tree. Adventist Home, page 482. Whatever, whether or not we have a Christmas tree in our church, let us bring our special gift to Jesus today. May the deacons please pass forward. Please join me as we bless uh, the offering this morning. Our generous and heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, with a heart of thanksgiving for everything that you have given us, Lord. For this holiday season that none of us decided for it to take place like this, but we're here, Father. We're here, and we thank you for the example that you have given us through your Son, Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and through many of your faithful leaders, Lord, who has helped us and guide us to understand how we should share your love during this holiday season. So, Father, we 
have these offerings and tithes here today. And we ask you that you may bless it. Bless it that it may continue to support this church's ministry and to support and extend our love, your love, Lord, that you have shared with us, Father. So, Lord, may your peace be in our hearts this holiday season and that the love that Jesus Christ share in us may continue to empower us throughout this season, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen.
like the sound of the flute, the way uh, Ashley and Nancy were playing for us there. It was such a happy sound, bringing a lot of joy, a lot of joy. I'd invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. You're familiar with the passages here, I'm sure, on the birth of uh, Jesus. Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 8 through 14. So Mary and Joseph have arrived in Bethlehem. Jesus is born and out in the fields. There were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill toward men Christmas time is a time of great rejoicing get to be with family get to go caroling if you like doing that some people go to concerts uh, in certain locations, they'll have a Messiah sing-along. That's always a, a, lot, a whole lot of fun. And uh, by the way, if there is one, please let me know. <laughs> this afternoon? Village Church Lancaster. All right. I have another appointment I'm being t reminded of. <laughs> anyway. All right, but for some people, Christmas is a time of struggle. Maybe they're living at home alone, or they're in a nursing home alone, or for some other reason, it's especially hard. Maybe they're missing a loved one who has recently passed away. And so this festive time of year, for some, can be a time of sadness. I'd ask you to Keep an eye out or think of people who you know, who could use a visit, who could use someone reaching out to them and touching them, giving them a hug. Just let them know that you love them and uh, it'll just warm their hearts at this time of year. I'm going to kneel and if your ankles and knees and all that uh, support that, I'd invite you to kneel with me as well. Our Father God in heaven, we're ever so grateful to you because you teach us about giving. You gave your son. You gave us life. You gave us breath. And giving is what you do constantly from a heart of love. And for us, Christmas is a, is a reminder that giving is important, just not now, but all throughout the year, to keep our hearts and eyes and minds attentive to where there's need, where we can bless, where we can help, where we can give hope, where we can speak words of encouragement, of love, of, of praise and thanks. We can do it for each other, and Lord, now we're giving you our thanks. As we sang, sang earlier, we can give you our heart. And so, Lord, we are choosing again today to give you our hearts with gratitude and thanks. I want to pray for the offering that was given, especially these gifts given just moments ago for Amira House an organization dedicated to helping those for whom life 
has been made very difficult, where they have been used and abused and manipulated. And they need to see that there is another way. There is hope. There is respect. There is being treated as valuable rather than just something to be used and discarded. Lord, each of us here is a valuable person. Each child, each adult, each individual here is valuable. And that great price, that great value for each one of us was shown when you came to this earth and died for us for love. To remove the curse of sin and to bring in the kingdom of righteousness in our hearts, in our lives, and then for eternity. And I thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.
on earth. Goodwill to all. Those are things that we like to greet ourselves with and it's on many Christmas cards that we pass around. But much like those shepherds of so long ago, we desperately still need peace and goodwill today. The war with Afghanistan is going strong 18 years later. By the end of 2018, 70.8 million individuals were forcibly displaced worldwide as a result of persecution, conflict, violence, or human rights violations. Of these, 2.6 million are living in refugee camps around the world. 37,000 people a day have to flee their homes. That's one person every two seconds. One one thousand, two one thousand. The lack of peace and goodwill, it's not just a global problem, but a local one as well. In the U.S., we have the largest prison population in the world. More people are spending Christmas behind bars in America than are living in major cities like Philadelphia and Dallas. Kids go to school and wonder when their active shooter drill is no longer going to be just a drill. Driving while black is a legitimate risk factor to many people. And ideologically, we seem more divided than ever. Conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican. Did you turn on the news this week? The way we as a nation talk to and about each other is a reflection of the hostility that's pervaded our lives. Snide remarks, bullying, name calling, putting people down and digging in our heels that we have to be the ones that are right. Belittling people down into caricatures, creating labels so we can cram people into boxes that allow us to see ourselves as superior. This foolishness, because that's all that it can be called, fills our homes and our hallways, our computers and our phones. We've forgotten that kindness has more of an impact than shouting out why we are right. We've forgotten the art of listening for understanding, not just to make our own rebuttal. We've forgotten that our experiences are not universal. Some of us have been hurt more than others. Some of us have been privileged more than others. 
We've forgotten that the people we dislike are not monsters or animals, but our fellow human beings. We've forgotten empathy. And I say we intentionally, because Christians are not exempt. Adventists are not exempt. At times, I know I am not exempt. We've made sport out of it. And we've been doing so for generations because we can't seem to get over ourselves. And that's why I want to look at Paul's letter to the Ephesians today. Paul's speaking to Gentiles, the ones whose nation of origin was causing them to see, be seen as outcasts in their own faith of Christianity, as if they were somehow naturally inferior. Paul's reminding them that the labels they are being given as a way to separate them are based on a faulty understanding of the promises of God. Jesus gave up his place in heaven to live like us, to die for us, in order to break down the walls that humanity created, to overturn our pride in nationalism, to bring us back to peace, to shalom, to wholeness. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I have the New American Standard Bible today. It's in all those little letters after Galatians. And I'm going to start with verse 11 and read straight through to 19. Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new person, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both into one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to you who are near. For through him we both have our access to one spirit, to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Before sending Jesus to earth, God worked predominantly through the Israelites. They were a favored nation and circumcised to show that status. However, they were not supposed to keep it to themselves. They were to be a light on the hill bringing all the nations to God. But it didn't happen that way. And now that Jesus and the gospel were actually bringing all people to God, there were some major issues. No longer was exclusion to be the law of the land. Through Christ, we can overcome whatever circumstances we were born into, because it's not about that. All who believe are to be welcomed into fellowship. And those who do not believe are still to be loved as if they did. And now this is just as hard for us today as it was back then. We have a track record, especially in the Christian church. On a side note, if you have the time, read The Color of Compromise and learn a little bit more about the history of race relations in our Christian church in America. Side tangent, but I encourage you to read that. But we have a track record of seeing others as second-class citizens based on whatever category we ourselves are not held prisoner to. But we are all equally God's favorite children. 
And so we can't hold the convictions that Jesus' blood only works for certain people or certain fundamental beliefs. Even those who don't want anything to do with God had their price paid. They don't have to accept the sacrifice, but it was still made on their behalf. Part of the gift of Jesus is that he served as a bridge, not only reconnecting humanity to heaven, but breaking down the walls that keep us apart from each other. In Paul's day, there were literal walls in the church to separate the men from the women and the Jews from the Gentiles. But separation has never been God's desire for his children. He came to bring a peace that transcends the labels and stereotypes and biases that we are so quick to pile on. Before we are male or female, rich or poor, queer or straight, black or brown or white, blue collar, white collar, immigrant or citizen, Christian or not, Republican or Democrat, we are all unquestionably and unrevocably loved by God. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. He died for all of humanity. Of this I am certain because the Bible tells me so. In 2 Peter 3, 9, why are we still stuck on this terminally sin-sick earth? 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you not wishing that any should perish, but for all to come to repentance. All, last time I checked, means everyone. Now, lest we get carried away, we do not have the sight that God has into our hearts and minds and lives and circumstances in order to say who has come to repentance. Fitting some mold of diet or dress or worship style is not an indicator of someone's repentance. Repentance and reconciliation is a lifelong journey. It's not a one and done, but it's something that we do with each other and with God for as long as we take breath. When we die to self, we die to needing to be right. We die to hostility. We die to the need for power. And when we are raised in the spirit, we are raised to reconciliation. We're raised to selfless love. We're raised to peace. And we're called to be a supportive community, not a dysfunctional family. So how much more should we join in peace and love with our brothers and sisters in Christ? We don't all have to agree on politics or how to do church. We do have to stop creating Christianity in our own image, each side claiming God's favor on themselves and God's wrath on anyone who might disagree with how we view things. We instead are to agree that everyone is worthy of love and respect, not because of who we are or who they are, but because Jesus died to give us our worthiness. Now peace, it's not some shaky truce or a negotiation to not have conflict. Peace is living in harmony, empowered by the Holy Spirit, united in love of God and love of others. Peace comes when we are continually connected with the Prince of Peace, checking our biases against our call to not just reflect his light, but to become that light ourselves. How long will it be before we who claim to follow Jesus will stop acting that, well, we believe people are equal, some are more equal than others? The walls that we create, especially those that have been created in Jesus' name, are the very walls that Jesus came to break down. Jesus, in his death, even tore the veil that separates heaven and earth. We are to look up, to come before the throne of God together. The only labels that we are to wear 
are beloved and redeemed. I want you to take a look at your bulletin cover. And if you've lost it, they should have it to put up on the screen. Now, I couldn't find the source for this quote, but I still found it very powerful, and it doesn't diminish the truth. So I want you all to read it with me, together. You ready? Peace. It does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. It means to be in the midst of these things and still be calm in your heart. We cannot create full peace on earth or even make ourselves have goodwill for all until we are living on the earth renewed. While we wait for that day, though, we ask God to keep working his peace in us, to quiet the anxiety and the fear that hide behind our unkind words and the thoughts that we have about others and ourselves. Ask God to make peace in you and through you. Consider what that might mean as we start wrapping up not only this year, but this decade. Will it be a desire to make peace with your family? Maybe to make peace, you have to decide that you leave your worries and stress from work at the door when you arrive home and be fully present with whoever you are with. Making peace might look like releasing control. Maybe, just maybe, peace for you will be the determination to finally trust God in the midst of all the chaos and the pain and the hurt when it doesn't go away. To stop rejecting the idea that Jesus really did give it all up to you because you don't understand how anyone could love you that much. Make peace with the idea that God is so much bigger than we can even imagine. Make peace with God so that you in turn can be used by God to counter all of this hostility that we are drowning in and we can become his peacemaker. To close the service today, Pastor Christy has picked a hymn that not many of us necessarily know. It's hymn number 204. So as we prep for this, I'm going to read through the words to give you a feel for the hymn. Come, long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. Free from our fears and sins release us. Let us live in our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art. Dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. I think the words here have been picked for a very good reason and add beautifully to the sermon. So let's join together and sing hymn number 204, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
Oh, Lord, help us to embody your kingdom here on earth. Take away our fear, our anxiety. Replace it with trust and peace in you, not just during this Christmas season, but for all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for watching our program today. If you have any questions, please call us at 781-438-2977. Again, that is 781-438-2977. We hope to see you soon in person here at our church on Saturdays for our 1045 a.m. worship service or for Monday night prayer time at 7 p.m. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.